In our whirlwind tour of the early Renaissance, we're moving on to sculpture and back to the famous competition panels for the Florence Cathedral's baptistry doors. Art historians often cite the 1401 contest as the opening event of the Renaissance. And these competing relief sculptures also serve as a good introduction to the works we'll be looking at today. Anyway, that's my story about why I'm going to talk about a non-required work, and I'm sticking with it. You've already learned that Ghiberti beat out Brunelleschi. Now that you know more about Renaissance aesthetics, I want you to think about what might have made the judges choose Ghiberti's interpretation of this dramatic biblical story. Remember, Ghiberti was very young, just 23. The city fathers and church leaders of Florence were taking a huge chance with a project that ultimately cost as much as the city's annual defense budget. Actually, it took the judges two years to make up their minds, and art historians still debate why Ghiberti beat out Brunelleschi. Both works are highly expressive and filled with movement. In both works, uh, in, in both works, the participants in the narrative display a realistic contrapposto stance. So both works have important Renaissance elements. One persuasive argument for the final decision is the Ghiberti's design, because it used less bronze, would cost the city fathers fewer florins. But I think there's probably a more important reason. While Brunelleschi's work is arguably more emotionally powerful, Ghiberti's shows a greater grasp of the spatial techniques that had largely disappeared after the fall of Rome. One of these techniques illustrated here was foreshortening. Note how Ghiberti's angel captures the distortion of the scene by the eye when an object or figure is viewed at a distance or at an unusual angle. This rather busy slide, which I think is in your workbook, gives a helpful summary and illustration of foreshortening. Another clue seems to lie in the way the artist chose to depict Isaac. What differences do you see? Ghiberti's Isaac is actually less emotional than Brunelleschi's, perhaps because he's caught sight of the angel, perhaps because he is representing a classical heroic ideal. But note his gorgeous nude body with its highly defined musculature. Ghiberti is consciously modeling Isaac on the Greco-Roman ideal. Okay, enough. We're moving on to Ghiberti's most famous student, Donatello. The scene sculpted for the baptismal font of Siena Cathedral is not a required work, but it does demonstrate some further important developments in Renaissance sculpture. There are a lot of Renaissance elements in this work. Like the paintings of Giotto, this work captures a very human narrative. We see horror on the faces of the banqueters suddenly confronted with John the Baptist's head. We see the children cowering in fear in the corner. The figures have real bodies under their clothes with muscles, flesh, and bone. But what really makes this work masterful is how it creates an illusion of depth. The foreground is sculpted in high relief, which becomes shallower as the scene moves up and back. The architectural features, including the floor tiles, help draw the eye back into the space, as does the open center, the rectangular table, and the pattern in the floor. Already, this work shows a great mastery of the one-point perspective that Filippo Brunelleschi has just discovered and systematized. And that brings us to one of the most important developments in art history, the mathematically based optical technique of perspective. The Greeks understood and employed perspective, and Pythagoras worked out much of the math required to make it work. But it was Brunelleschi and his Italian Renaissance successors who would rediscover and then build on Pythagoras' insights. I chose this photo because it demonstrates the simplest optical perception of depth. As we look down the road into the distance, the space narrows. Eventually, at the horizon point, it disappears. And this is also called the vanishing point. The white lines on the road edge uh, make convenient orthogonals, and I've tried to draw the horizon line. I do not think Brunelleschi would have me on as an would hire me on as an assistant. This diagram makes the same point more schematically. The horizon line lies on li lies on a line with the vanishing point. The ground line represents the place where we stand, the viewer. And these diagonals, known as orthogonals, provide a mathematical means of drawing to optical or perspective scale. I'm not going to ask Mrs. Whitaker to show the Khan Academy Introduction to Linear Perspective in class. It's longer and more detailed than you need, although, of course, you're welcome to watch it. The link is up on Canvas.
But if you have time, I hope you can spend a, a minute or so watching Mrs. Whitaker play around with the interactive, which is also up on campus. Back to Donatello. The good news is that I don't think the College Board is likely to ask you to attribute a work that you haven't studied to Donatello, mostly because his work is just too extraordinarily varied to pin down with a simple comparison. Here are three of his most famous sculptures. You should see that the, cla the, you should see the classical influence in the statue of St. Mark with its contrapposto and naturally flowing draperies. Judith adds a contemporary political message to the biblical narrative. We talked about that early in the year. The Mary Magdalene, which is my personal favorite, is extraordinarily expressive. It reminds me of the Rotkin Pieta. And now finally we get to our one required work of early Renaissance sculpture. The immediate context for Donatello's David was Florence's defeat of the stronger Duchy of Milan in 1401. Goliath is really taking on the role of the Duke of Milan in this sculpture. Of course, you could argue that the rather dictatorial Medici were themselves usurping the symbolism. That's what the people of Florence seemed to think when they moved the statue out of the Medici Palace courtyard and into the Piazza della Signoria or Town Hall after the Medici fell from, from favor. But what do you think of the statue itself? I'd like your honest reactions here. Well, I'll tell you what struck me right between the eyes when I first saw the statue in the flesh, that is, in Florence. It is deeply and almost creepily sensual, and I say creepily because, to me at least, it has overtones of pedophilia, and because the figure's nudity is accentuated and made more provocative by the fact that he's still wearing boots and a hat. The feather from Goliath's hat that sneaks up David's thigh unrealistically and even disturbingly high up David's thigh, and that almost sleepy expression add to the sensuality of the sculpture. This seems rather at odds with the militaristic moment and the politi political significance of David to the Florentines. Donatello's David is not only the first freestanding nude in a thousand years, it also represents the rebirth of cast bronze sculpture. Bronze have been used for sculpted doors, but not for sculptures on this scale. The statue contains many other important classical elements. We see the off-kilter symmetria, reminiscent of classical Greek, scul Greek sculpture. Donatello sets up a dynamic contrast between bent and straight, relaxed and tense. There's been a lot of speculation about the meaning of the soft hat, but clearly it creates an interesting juxt juxtaposition with Goliath's military helmet, the headgear of a peaceful shepherd versus the armor of war. Note, too, how the rock balances the sword. Again, this may be a deliberate contrast between peaceful mercantile Florence and militaristic Milan. We don't really know how the people of Florence viewed this statue. Some art historians even think it was actually thought to be a depiction of Mercury. But they must have admired it to give Donatello's David such a prominent place at the heart of Florentine power. Florentine sculptors actually produced three famous Davids for the city that loved this hero. We'll get to Michelangelo's David in a couple of days. This bronze by Verrocchio was sculpted a few decades after Donatello's. What differences do you notice? Well, this David, too, is an adolescent, but he's a cocky bad boy. Your textbook suggests that the model might have been one of Verrocchio's streetwise apprentices. And, of course, he keeps his clothes on, which strikes me as a good call when facing off against a giant. The postures are nevertheless quite similar, and the off-kilter contraposto stance is obvious in both of them. And both show a beautiful young male body. I think this is a very intriguing example of how different artistic visions shape different versions of works on the same theme. And I'm going to stop here and move on to an early, Renaissance, to early Renaissance painting in my next podcast.